right, I'm going to get started today. Um, we have three very amazing presentations by our residents. First up is Dr. Reinhardt, who will be presenting a interesting case on diplopia, um, and he's one of our excellent pediatric neurology residents. Everyone hear me? Okay. So I've uh, unmanaged, unmanaged, unimaginatively detailed as the cause of diplopia. So this case, uh, the patient is 21 years old. Um, he's right-handed and he's presenting for chronic and progressive diplopia. Um, he first noticed it when he was about 16 years old. Um, he told us that he would turn his head over his shoulder to look at something and he'd see double. And that was the main time that it happened. He also noticed it at, during heightened times of stress. Um, he uh, was relatively stable until around the age of 22. He was on a mission trip in South America, at which point he noticed more consistent diplopia um, in multiple directions of gaze. Sometime between the age of 16 and 22, he also started seeing some very slight ptosis. Of note, his dad also has very mild ptosis, but doesn't have the diplopia symptoms that his son has. He also endorsed the somewhat vague symptoms of fatigue um, and hip, knee, and ankle pain bilaterally. The onset of this wasn't exactly clear. So I don't have a picture of my patient, but this would be a representative picture, um, just noticing that there's relatively symmetric ptosis and it's kind of hard to appreciate in this, uh, like just on a front on view, but there's a chin up posture um, that this patient is demonstrating. So moving into the exam, uh, the visual acuity was relatively normal. This is uncorrected. His pupils were normal and reactive. And then there was symmetric limitation in right gaze and down gaze. There was more limitation of adduction of the right eye than the left. Um, when he looks to the left, it's apparent that his right eye cannot adduct at all. Um, his right eye is also slightly more limited in superduction than the left. Um, this resulted in an exotropia and a right hypertropia, which I'll show you the, this is the uh, slide for the strabismus exam. Okay. And then for the slit lamp exam, just notable for ptosis, it's a little worse on the right than on the left. And then we did take some pictures. And so um, it's uh, uh, notable for pigmentary, um, peripheral pigmentary streaks. And it might be hard to kind of appreciate in the setting, but if you can kind of look, it's almost like a little bit of a circular type darkening here. And then in the same, approximate region over here, there's some pigmentary streaks that are a little bit abnormal as well. Um, oh yeah, and then on this slide, you might not be able to appreciate it, but there is some temporal paler on the optic disc that was reproduced on the RNFL, um, more obvious on the right than on the left. Okay. Um, this patient came to us uh, having been worked up uh, to some extent for this condition. So we had some coronal MRI um, thin slices like with an orbital sequence. So this is the patient's, and then I kind of have this um, normal control on the left side of the screen. And in, again, it might be hard to totally appreciate just because it's not exactly the same cut, but I think it's relatively obvious that these are nice and bulky and juicy, these are not. Another thing to appreciate about our patient's presentation is that the muscles are relatively symmetrically atrophied. Again, he came to us with a couple labs. Um, he had had a myasthenia gravis workup that had been negative um, on antibody testing. He hadn't had any EMGs done. He had an AST of 102, but the remainder of the CMP was normal, as was his CBC, CRP, ESR, and TSH. So that kind of summarizes most of the information we had going into this case. Um, so just to summarize, this is a 21-year-old man with chronic, slowly progressive diplopia, ptosis, retinal pigmentary changes, and mild optic atrophy. He also has fatigue, joint pain, and a family history of progressive ptosis, specifically in his father. So for this presentation, um, there's a this is like a limited or kind of bot, like a grouped uh, differential. 
So in this kind, this kind of presentation, you can think of a neuromuscular junction disorder. So myasthenia gravis was obviously on the previous ophthalmologist's mind. Um, you could think of what would what would be might be called neurogenic causes of ophthalmoplegia, if you'll pardon that term. Uh, so like multiple sclerosis, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Miller, Miller Fisher variant, um, those types of things. Mitochondrial disorders um, could also cause this type of presentation, and of course, thyroid eye disease would also be a possible cause. So for this patient, we felt that his presentation most closely resembled um, mitochondrial chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. I will be calling this CPEO moving forward. So like I said, there was some testing that had been completed prior to the patient's arrival by his uh, other ophthalmologist. This is a limited uh, gene panel um, that was negative. Um, it was sent through this Athena Diagnostics. This patient came from Texas. I'm not sure if this is uh, the one that their ophthalmologist used. Um, Emily Spoth is one of our genetic counselors. She works in uh, neurology as well as ophthalmology. Discussed this case with her, and I asked her, what type of genetic testing would you do? So looking at this panel and then compare it to this, um, this panel uh, that Emily thought would be more appropriate. Um, Hopefully you can probably can't see the individual ones, but the idea is it's a lot more than what they tested for. This is the site that she tends to refer people to. Um, there is a move is in, in mitochondrial testing as well as many other genetic testing just to go towards whole genome or a whole mitochondrial genome sequencing. It just is more of a matter of um, money and technic technical limitations. So at some point we might just be doing whole genomes on everything. And I'll talk a little bit more about the genetic testing um, at the end that you can also do at the end of the presentation. But first, I want to kind of talk about this syndrome. So remember, a syndrome is a collection of clinical and historical findings that together point to a particular set of diagnoses. So for the syndrome of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, CPEO, you want progressive ptosis. You want impaired ocular motility in both eyes. It should, again, be bilateral involvement. The affected muscles should be innervated by more than one muscle or by more than one nerve. The pupil should be spared. There should be gradual progression over years, and there typically shouldn't be any remissions or exacerbations. So the, the differential I gave, um, you can think of CPO as the syndrome. You can look back to that differential I gave and kind of work through those things as you're working on patients with this condition. So I want to talk a little bit about mitochondrial CPO. So you can think of CPO as being um, mitochondrial ophthalmoplegia as being on a spectrum. You have the simplest, uh, most uh, limited form, which is CPEO. You have CPEO plus, and then you have these more classic syndromes. I think many of us are probably aware of Perrin-Sayer syndrome from med school. Um, and again, you go from one end with limited involvement to the other end where everything's involved. Um, there's been a recent reclassification according to, by the mitochondrial North American uh, consortium that CPO can include uh, limb myopathy, dysphagia, and exercise intolerance. Previously, CPO plus would have been, would have like subsumed uh, basically anyone who had any other findings other than the eye findings. So you might see some differences in nomenclature in that area. And for time's sake, I won't go and get into all the things that CPO plus can involve, but this is just a picture uh, representing, obviously anywhere there's a mitochondria, there can be a problem. And there's many, many systems and presentations, including neurologic, psychiatric, endocrine, um, MSK, um, joint involvement. It's, it's basically, it's a huge, huge list. So thinking about, so I just want to keep this on your minds as ophthalmologists. Um, there is, um, there's always a concern that something beyond the eyes could be involved when you have mitochondrial CPO as, uh, as your differential. So this article looked at all the cases of mitochondrial um, disease in North America. So there's about 666 genetically concern, confirmed cases. I think this is in 2015, 2018. I've put arrows next to the ones that have um, ophthalmologic, um, primary ophthalmologic manifestations. If you count up this number, it's roughly 100. And then if you look at CPEO, that's like 18. So about 
you know, 20% of patients that have a mitochondrial apomoplegia will have an isolated mitochondrial apomoplegia. So what I'm just trying to get across is if you think they have mitochondrial disease, you really have to be thinking beyond the eye in most cases. So if you're thinking beyond the eye, what would you do as part of your workup? Um, so thinking back to that differential diagnosis, obviously, if you have a, this progressive apomoplegia, you don't want to just necessarily jump right to mitochondrial disease. You want to think of other things such as mimics. Um, so you want to get typically an ESR, CRP, TSH, T4, T TSH receptor antibody disease, myasthenia gravis antibody panel. You want to get MRI brain with orbits. And then we want we recommend you get an EKG as well. Um, Karen Sayer syndrome and a number of other of these mitochondrial disease present with cardiac arrhythmias. So that's like a good don't miss thing. Other tests that you could obtain, but um, probably would, you can just leave it probably to the neuroophthalmologist is you can talk about getting lactate, pyruvate, CK, acylcarnitine, urine organic acids, glucose, echo, EMG, all that type of stuff kind of depends on your practice situation. I will say probably of these kind of italicized ones, CK is probably the more accessible one um, that you could all order. And then if you're a general ophthalmologist, obviously referring to a neuro-ophthalmologist is a good idea. Uh, neuromuscular doctors also handle this type of thing. If you are relatively convinced that this is a uh, mitochondrial disease, you could just jump to making refer to a metabolics clinic that deals with mitochondrial disease. And then if you happen to be here at the U, as I imagine you are, if you're watching this, uh, you could also email Emily Spath, who is a, like I said, our genetic counselor. And she kind of give you some tips about genetic testing. If you want to place these orders for genetic testing, that's okay. But obviously um, they're going to need to be seen by a neuro-ophthalmologist. So you might, so you could also just wait for them to see the, the patient. So that is all I have for today. Are there any questions about this topic? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so I guess just the term like CPEO, um, so that's like a clinical syndrome, right? And then you could have like CPO due to Kernsayer, um, which is more like a genetic, you know, that's like a specific genetic cause of CPO plus other stuff. Is that right? Yeah. So the question, is, I don't know if anyone can hear that. The question is, is CPO a clinical syndrome or is it a diagnosis? I think it's kind of both. So like you have mitochondrial CPEO and that's like a diagnosis, um, but this constellation of bilateral um, findings, multiple cranial nerve involvement, progressive ptosis, that would be like a syndrome. You could think of that as a syndrome as well. So like, oh, that, wow, well, that's a lot louder. Um, does CPO, that's like associated with a specific gene, like isolated CPO is like a specific genetic syndrome or... Um, so, mitochond so mitochondrial CPO has like multiple genes that could cause oh, okay. it. I didn't look in depth into oh, okay. that answer. Okay. One particular paper I read showed that there was um, poor association with particular mutations and particular um, phenotypes. Okay. That's like the rule in mitochondrial disease. It's so heterogeneous okay. because there's so many things like heteroplasmy in play. So, okay. um, so you could have like, you know, the... I guess the gene doesn't necessarily make the diagnosis of like MELAS or MRF or whatever. It's like, you're just looking at like the clinical picture of like what specific manifestations does the person have? Or... Um, I would say I'm not a hundred, hundred percent sure yeah. of the answer to that, but like there might be one gene that's always associated with this particular syndrome. But from my reading, uh, generally speaking, there's not one gene that causes one syndrome. Okay. Um, and there's many different, phenotypes are associated with each syndrome and gene. So, okay. Thank you. So what are you going to do to get rid of his double vision? Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to mention <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so the question, what are we going to do to get rid of his double vision? So in this patient, we did send basically repeated some of the workup. We sent him to neuromuscular, um, for a consultation. We also sent him to the pigment, uh, retina specialist, um, we're kind of waiting, and then we we're going to repeat genetic testing. We wanted to wait to do any interventions till we had a little more data, but the plan is potentially to do surgery to correct his ptosis and to try to fix his ocular misalignment, so strabismus surgery, ptosis. 
Yep. Just when you're going to do have somebody do the surgery, it needs to be focused on what's going on in primary position, mm -hmm. not what's going on off to his left, having operated on many of these patients. Um, and I, I agree, the, the clinical spectrum of this, having done this long before anybody did genetic testing for it and figured out what was going on, is, is very interesting. And I've seen this both from the standpoint of showing up with motility issues, which is fascinating to me with this patient, or the patients who show up with unexplained decreased vision. And then it dawned on me that they had optic nerve pallor and vessel narrowing and pigmentary retinal changes. And then we kind of went down that road and, and that's what they turned out that, you know, they, they had other changes that kind of led us down that path. This is cool. Good presentation. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next up we have Dr. Mohammed, who's one of our top four PGY3s presenting on an excellent case of uveitic glaucoma. Top four, man. I've been waiting for so long. <laughs> I finally made it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just a little bit of an audible on the title, but I'm presenting uh, uveitis and glaucoma. And I uh, saw an interesting case um, in the uveitis clinic that was um, uh, interesting in the sense of just kind of this patient's unfortunate course and just wanted to kind of have a discussion about if that was okay with us at the end. I don't have any um, disclosures, but um, I was pretty naive when I started residency. All the um, lunches and dinners that we had from these drug reps, I didn't realize like anytime they made a sign uh, in that uh, we would be uh, in the CMS, like open uh, payments database. So I do have to disclose my list of free lunch providers and, and Johnson and & Johnson, Bosch and & Lom, and uh, Genentech are the top players here. Um, as far as this case presentation, a uh, very unfortunate um, uh, course, and um, I'll probably spend the first half kind of talking about his clinical course, second half talking about uveitis and glaucoma, and then if we have time, maybe a, a quick case discussion in regards to kind of the decision making. Um, absolutely, that would be fantastic. Um, so we have a, well, that'd be great if I can yeah, take a look here too. <laughs> uh, so a 28 year old male, uh, no past medical history is pre presented to an outside ophthalmologist in Idaho uh, back around um, June of 2022, reporting three months of haze and um, vision and floaters in both eyes. His examination at this time showed um, normal IOP visual acuity of 2025, uh, normal anterior segment examination. Uh, his posterior segment examination was notable for trace cells, uh, vitreous debris in both eyes, and snowballs inferiorly in both eyes. Uh, and then MAC OCT showed mild CME. Uh, he declined laboratory workup um, for uh, presumed intermediate uveitis, and he was diagnosed with idiopathic uh, pars planitis. Uh, this patient was started on Durazol and Ketorolac BID with plan for follow-up in six months to uh, see how his inflammation was going. Um, he presented uh, one month later here. Uh, visual acuity um, is decreased to 2040. His IOP is uh, 16 and 12. He still has persistent vitreous debris in both eyes. He had worsening CME in the right eye. Uh, and mild morsened uh, CME in the left eye. Uh, he was offered increasing um, Durazol and Ketorolac versus Ozerdex versus um, Subtenon's Kenalog. He opted to increase topical therapy um, and he was started on uh, post opt uh, because at the last visit he had uh, mildly elevated uh, IOP after uh, starting topical steroids. Plan was to follow up in two months. Late November of 2022, he reports that his vision is getting blurrier. His visual acuity now is 20, uh, 80 uh, and 2015 in the left eye. IOP is in the high teens. He still has persistent vitreous debris, new inferior snowballs that were not seen at his last exam, uh, and improving CME. Um, he had been uh, having trouble obtaining uh, Durazol, so he had actually been using uh, Pret Forte as well as Ketorolac. Uh, given his persistent uh, inflammation as well as the decreased visual acuity, he was offered to either increase his Pret Forte versus Ozerdex versus SDK versus vitrectomy at this visit. And he um, uh, opted to increase topical therapy. He had uh, continued the uh, um, IOP lowering medication as well as Ketorolac. Next month, his visual acuity now is 2,400. Uh, he's 20 uh, in the right eye, 2,100 in the left eye. His IOP is 14 and 16. He now has a little bit of anterior chamber inflammation. 
Um, he still has persistent vitreous debris, no CME. At this time, he was offered uh, to try obtaining a um, the Dorazol prescription that he had done previously versus Ozardex versus SDK. He elected to try um, uh, seeing if his insurance would pay for Dorazol, if not pursuing SDK. Uh, January of 2023, he was unable to get the Dorazol, and he underwent a subtenance catalog in the right eye, plans for follow-up in one month. At this visit in February, his uh, visual acuity is 2,400 uh, in the right and 2,800 in the left. His IOP is elevated. Uh, now it's 25 and 26. He has trace cells uh, and persistent vitreous debris, no CME. He was offered contralateral uh, subtenons in the left eye. One month later, he's 2,800 in the right eye, 2,400 in the left. His IOP now is in the mid-30s. Answer segment examination shows trace cells, uh, new, micro, new microcystic corneal edema, um, and still persistent vitreous debris. MACO CT was unable to be obtained in the right eye due to the poor view, no CME in the left eye. He was started on Diamox in the clinic and then uh, BID at home, as well as Latanoprost, uh, and then was uh, offered to continue the COSOPT. Plan was for one week follow up. March of 2023, his IOP is a little bit better, but still high, 28 uh, and 30 in the right and left, respectively. He did not get a visual acuity at this visit. Um, Dimox was continued, as well as the Latina person co-stopped. The plan was to follow up in two weeks. At this visit in April of 2023, his visual acuity now is 2,800 in the right eye, 2,400 in the left. IOP now is in the 40s. He has um, microcystic corneal edema. Uh, they do a, a fundus examination with uh, elevated cup to disc ratio now 0.6, uh, unable to get the MAC with CT in the right, no CME in the left. Again, received Diamox in the office, so was instructed to continue the Diamox at home, um, continue the Latanoprost and COSOPT, and then an urgent referral to a glaucoma specialist where he underwent sequential trabeculectomy uh, that next month. And then that's when he was referred to the Moran Eye Center uh, in the uveitis clinic for uh, this bilateral intermediate uveitis. Uh, so as far as a case summary, um, a gentleman who was 29 years old, no prior or medical history, um, inflammation was not controlled on topical steroids, underwent sequential bilateral subtenance catalog injections. Uh, in January of 2023, his course was sub subsequently complicated by severe steroid response with IOPs in the 40s who underwent bilateral trabeculectomy the next month. Um, when the UV Addis service saw him, his visual acuity was counting fingers in the uh, right eye, uh, pinhole to 2040 in the left. Uh, of note, he had uh, had the um, trabeculectomy more recently in the right, I believe. I think he was like post-op uh, week two. Um, no evident APD as far as his anterior segment examination uh, had the superior trab uh, blebs as well as the inferior catalog, LASIK flap, uh, and then his um, optic nerves were extremely cupped, uh, 0.9. This is his RNFL, which you can appreciate severe thinning, uh, more notable on the right. At this initial visit with UV Addis, he was quiet. Um, he was started on IMT methotrexate given his history of chronic inflammation and um, the uh, steroid um, response as well. He did finally get a laboratory uh, workup as well. Um, and then you had, I did not mention, but um, in his examination, he had diffuse PSC, uh, likely as the sequelae of his um, uh, trabeculectomy as well. Um, and we had recommended uh, deferral of uh, cataract surgery until he was at least quiet for three months. Plan was to follow up in two months with a follow up with his glaucoma uh, provider. Uh, one month later, his infectious inflammatory workup came back normal. He's still quiet. Visual acuity continues to be counting fingers in the right eye, uh, 2030 in the left. His IOP now, however, is low, three and four by aplanation. Uh, MAC OCT did not show any signs of hypotony maculopathy. He was continued on the methotrexate. He had been on Lotomax um, as kind of his post operative medication from the TRAB, and um, plan was to start. Forte BID to increase his IOP uh, with follow-up in two to three months in UV at his clinic and then the glaucoma specialist in six weeks. October 2023, he's still quiet. Visual acuity remains stable, but he still continues to have very low IOP. There is now mild uh, hypotony maculopathy in the right eye, which you can see here. Um, and also continue methotrexate, increases Pet Forte to QID, uh, follow-up in two to three months, as well as uh, continued follow-up with his glaucoma provider. And then this was his most recent visit, and uh, this is when I saw him. He's quiet in both eyes, visual acuity, is counting fingers in the right eye. He's 2,500 in the left eye. Um, IOP remains low, 5 and 3. Uh, MAC OCT shows significant hypotonic maculopathy in the left eye. And this is his uh, MAC OCT. Um, we had elected to continue his methotrexate 
uh, as well. Um, he had been placed on Dorazol by the outside provider. We had um, recommended increase to QID dosing. Um, he had been actually planning to undergo cataract surgery uh, in the left eye in late, late January of 2024 upcoming. Um, and at this visit, we had recommended closure of his trabeculectomy at the time of cataract surgery, as well as preoperative uh, oral steroid uh, taper. Uh, plan is to follow up in six weeks post-surgery. Um, so I don't know how you felt, but I almost had a visceral reaction with kind of that clinical course, uh, particularly a 29-year-old male um, going from 2025 visual acuity to um, kind of fingers in one eye to 2,800 uh, in 2,500 in, in the left eye. So just wanted to kind of give a quick overview, particularly in, in um, glaucoma and uveitis. It's certainly a uh, complex um, intersection between uh, two uh, disease processes, but uh, we're lucky to be in an academic institution. So I'm hopeful to just kind of go over a quick overview and then maybe have a case discussion in regards to both um, uveitis and glaucoma, and maybe some people can, can weigh in in regards to what they would have done differently in this case. Um, but as far as pathophysiology, the mechanism that determine um, IOP increases in uh, UV to glaucoma and, and steroid uh, response are pretty diverse and complex. Um, they're often simultaneously present in, in the same patient. Up to one-third of uh, patients treated with uveitis uh, have elevated IOP. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell, you know, if it, the elevated IOP is secondary to like a steroid response versus the actual inflammation here. We can likely guess it's a uh, steroid response given he had inflammation, you know, pre and post and when he had received the subtenons catalog as well as the um, topicals, he had an elevated IOP. Family history of glaucoma, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and younger age are risk factors for a steroid response. As far as the open angle and uh, closed angle mechanisms, you can have both in um, uveitis. So certainly we know about the secondary angle closure that can result from scenicular closure, a new vascularization, as well as the uh, seclusion pupillae. And then as far as the open angle mechanisms, um, you just kind of get clogged up in the trabecular mesh work. As far as a steroid response, we don't really know the exact mechanism, but you do have increased resistance uh, to outflow and how uh, the trabecular mesh work. And then less common of angle closure is when inflammation and edema causes the ciliary body to um, kind of rotate forward, and oftentimes you see that in VKH. Uh, glaucoma occurs in about 20% uh, 20 of patients with chronic uveitis, um, and the incidence and clinical appearance is different according to disease etiology. I was going to go through a quick uh, kind of six... Um, uh, Specific etiologies, particularly in uveitic glaucoma, uh, Fuchs heterochromic uveitis, which we know is a triad of uveitis, heterochromia, and cataract, unilateral, uh, chronic low grade uh, inflammation. Um, recent studies have shown that um, about 40% of eyes are CMV positive. Uh, PSS has unilateral recurrent episodes of myocyclitis. Myop is usually normal between attacks, and um, there was a seminal paper by, uh, I think, Dr. Posner that kind of showed or graphed the um, IOP attacks with uh, quiescent periods in between. And again, uh, many of these patients are CMV positive as well. Our herpetic uveitis, which um, certainly a lot of the residents have, and I have seen on call, uh, most common complication of patients with uh, herpetic uveitis, usually um, unilateral. You have inflammation of the trabecular meshwork. Oftentimes you can see uh, iris atrophy um, as a sequelae of, of this disease process and um, stromal carotid uveitis is a hallmark of this disease. Uh, JI, JIA um, associated with uveitis as well. Um, up to 42% of patients can have elevated uh, IOP. Um, you can have low-grade inflammation. Um, oftentimes, patients don't have any symptoms, so uh, hence why screening is important. And oftentimes, you see a lot of these patients in the pediatric clinics as well. IMT therapy is necessary to treat this. Uh, BKH, which I haven't seen, but um, presents as a bilateral pet in uveitis. What's uh, pretty interesting is in this disease process is there's an anterior rotation of the ciliary body here. And then postoperative uveitic glaucoma, which I think we've all seen, um, can be secondary to retained nuclear uh, cortical lens fragments. You can have malposition or subla subluxation of intraocular lenses, uh, oftentimes presenting as UG syndrome. And here you have a uh, scan here looking at an eye wall, um, kind of shaping the uh, posterior surface of that iris on the nasal side of this patient. Um, as far as diagnosis, you know, routinely we do get RNFL OCTs. Um, it's important to know that uveitis is a confounding factor in assessing RNFL thickness. Uh, substantial thickening can happen um, in uh, inflammatory eyes, and this is thought to be due to a breakdown of the uh, blood retinal barrier as well as uh, production of uh, prostaglandin uh, analogs. Um, and then importantly, um, you know, you should be screening for glaucomatous um, RNFL changes uh, during quiescent periods in patients that are um, that have uveitis, and uh, you can have continued thinning of the RNFL despite good IOP control. 
And uh, you should note that that can be due to resolution of the edema rather than actual progression. UBM and anterior segment are helpful, um, particularly in cases where you can't have kind of a good view to uh, look in the back and you can uh, see different types of angle closure. Um, UBM is um, very helpful in, in cases of chronic ocular hypotenuse as well as uh, looking for anterior, ciliary, uh, anterior rotation of the ciliary body. Um, and then you can use anterior segment OCT to uh, look at um, two placement in glaucoma drainage devices. As far as the management of uveal glaucoma, obviously it's a you know very complex disease. Um, requires you know kind of a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Um, knowing the etiologic um, diagnosis is important for treatment. Um, Anti-inflammatory anti treatments. Um, we know that corticosteroids are our first line um, uh, in many cases. Uh, NSAIDs have not been shown to be helpful in uh, uveal glaucoma and um, can actually um, partially block the hypotensive effects of some glaucoma medications, which I did not know. Um, and then certainly um, immunosuppression uh, can be needed, particularly in cases where you either have a lot of inflammation or non-responsive uh, to corticosteroids, or you have um, um, corticosteroid-induced uh, elevated IOP, uh, hence coordination with the uveitis specialist or rheumatologist is advisable in these cases where uh, these immunosuppressive drugs could have systemic um, effects on the body. As far as the anti-glaucomatous drugs, they can uh, vary in the presence of inflammation as far as efficacy, um, and less topical medication may be absorbed. Uh, traditionally, topical beta blockers as well as uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can um, have been considered first line. And then certainly in our case, we know that uh, systemic uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, have to be used if the IOP is not controlled. Um, these are just a quick overview. I think we know all of these uh, disease um, or uh, classes of medications, but obviously caution uh, with prostaglandins and herpetic keratitis. Uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can be uh, helpful uh, in, in particular cases where CME uh, is coexistent. And then um, uh, I've seen case reports at least for alpha-2 adrenergic uh, agonists where you can have this granulomatous anterior uveitis that has been described after use of uh, aproclonidine and, and bromonidine. And the inflammation typically uh, succeeded an allergic response um, and faded after uh, stopping the medication. As far as surgical management with uh, uveitis glaucoma, about 30% of eyes with uh, uveitis glaucoma may require surgery. Uh, surgical success rate is lower in eyes um, with uveitis glaucoma compared to POAG, and uh, oftentimes it's because of the inflammatory response. Uh, significant risk factors for surgical failure include male sex, age younger than 45, uh, non glomerulitis uh, uveitis, as well as a prolonged uh, postoperative inflammatory period. Uh, I was just going to go over a quick um, uh, overview of kind of the, the, the four I've at least seen um, here in residency that have been used in uh, management of uh, glaucoma. Um, drainage device is often considered first line, uh, especially in etiologies with active inflammation. Uh, studies have shown all three common types. Um, the Ahmed, Barveld, and Multino are effective in lowering intraocular pressure. I haven't seen any studies that have compared valve versus non-valve. Um, uh, drainage devices that are preferable in um, uh, uveitic glaucoma. And oftentimes, um, uh, the Ahmed can be um, more convenient because of its unidirectional uh, valve mechanism and uh, possibly helping prevent uh, postoperative hypotony, particularly in our case here. Uh, these are kind of some of the uh, short-term complications as far as encapsulated blood, transit, um, hypotony, hyphema. As far as trabeculectomy, historically has been the procedure of choice in treating UG with the exception of APA kicks, new vascularization, and uh, poor visual function. Current standard of care is to use adjuvant anti-proliferatives uh, just because the rates uh, as far as success have been lower without their use. Um, and there is a higher risk of progression of cataracts uh, with trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. In our case, we did see the um, pretty dense PSCs after his bilateral traps. As far as goniotomy, often offered for refractive glaucoma, particularly in um, chronic childhood uveitis, the largest series I saw was uh, 54 goniotomies in uh, 40 eyes. Overall success rate was at, uh, 72%. A recent series by um, Chen and Al at... Um, at Cole Eye Institute uh, showed that goniotomy uh, did demonstrate favorable efficacy and safety in uh, steroid-induced and uveitic glaucoma eyes. Um, and these were 24 eyes and 22 patients that underwent goniotomy, and they had sustained IOP and glaucoma medication burden at 24 months, and I think success was uh, determined uh, by IOP lowering by 20%. And then as far as um, cycloablative procedures, um, we know that they can exacerbate inflammation 
high risk of postoperative hypotony and um, uh, physis, often used in refractive, uh, refractive glaucoma, particularly in eyes with poor visual potential and uh, where conventional drainage or surgery has failed. Um, SLT has been suggested by some as an alternative treatment, and uh, many of us might uh, kind of have trepidation, particularly due to you know the risk of IOP increase or uh, intraocular inflammation. Um, there were a couple case series by uh, these two authors, Sir Sadiq and Zhao, that showed efficacy of SLT in steroid-induced glaucoma with um, greater response and lower failure rate than actual um, POAG and pseudoexfoliation, which I found interesting. Certainly, um, steroid response IOP like rises higher than you know pseudoexfoliation and, and glaucoma. That might be one of the confounders of the study, but uh, interesting nonetheless. And then um, UV to glaucoma had similar results to uh, pseudoexfoliation as well as POAG. Um, so that's my quick overview. I just wanted to do a quick case summary and timeline. I, I think the most beneficial, at least for me, would be just to kind of hear what the audience thinks of kind of this uh, course of uh, this patient, particularly if anything that they would have done differently and uh, maybe any pearls in terms of their practice. Mubarak. Mubarak, thanks for your presentation. A uh, great, great overview. It's, it's, these are tough cases. The therapeutic window for uveitic glaucoma is very, as Norm likes to say, is a, is a razor's edge. Um, the difference between doing too much or too little. My general presence, you know, it's, it's easy for me to sit back and make comments in hindsight here on this case, but I do think that. Uh, an earlier involvement in terms of glaucoma control and a mitigation plan would have been better instituted. I think we oftentimes uh, feel that uveitis needs to be under control before you can actually do something surgically, but I would actually argue against that. In this case, I think the patient lost a significant amount of vision and nerve optic nerve tissue because of not being more aggressive with actually intervening sooner uh, on the surgical side. Uh, and rather, in, with, the de with the delay in managing the IOP, I think this patient suffered a tremendous amount of optic nerve damage that could have been prevented, I think, um, if the glaucoma specialist had in, been involved a little bit earlier. In terms of the choice of surgical treatment, uh, Dan Bettis and Grant Morchetti, some of our prior fellows, did a review of our cases here at the Moran in like 2015 and looked at those cases that went underwent a TRAV versus an Ahmed valve. And both were successful, but the Ahmed valves won out a little bit at about 12 months in terms of success rate. So I would say it's not a, a party line rule that you put an Ahmed valve for everybody with uveitic glaucoma, but I would say that it's a reasonable choice. Uh, number one is that these patients are often going to be receiving a ton of steroids already, and we know that steroids are not only going to increase the IOP potentially from the steroid response, but they also can delay encapsulation of the plate. And ultimately, that is what serves as the, the, the biological valve of the success rate for any valve, whether you put a non-valve tube in or a valve tube in, it's often the tenons that's going to predict how that, that uh, patient's going to do with that particular intervention. Something that we're doing now is actually doing a hybrid. Uh, we want the safety of an AMID valve just in case the patient does uh, start to become aqueous suppressed and not produce enough aqueous. So some of us are now tying off the AMID valve. So treating it as if it's a non-valve device and essentially allowing it to open up in stages uh, so that hopefully we can get a better capsular um, response and a more permeable capsule over the long run. So we don't have any data on that, but it's just something that we're trying to do to mitigate against significant hypotony. And we have had a few cases of hypotony even after an Ahmed valve uh, that technically should protect against that. So there's no absolute guarantees. These are tough cases. And I, and I think... You have to be prepared. Uh, Cole has a great case. If, if you guys ever want to see a, or Tim, I believe, has a really interesting case of how we revised an Ahmed valve three different ways on a patient who had uveitic glaucoma. Uh, initially, we put the Ahmed valve in and she, she became hypotenuse. And then we attenuated the tube. And on the table, just simply attenuating the tube, you could still see that she was over filtering. Uh, so then we actually ended up um, putting a stent in, a stent suture where we took. I believe it was proline, and we flanged it like we do a Yamani uh, haptic. And then we stuffed it in, in, in the lumen of the tube intracamerally in order to shut down the tube completely. And then about four to six weeks later, when we could see that her aqueous production was starting to pick up, we went back in and then pulled the stent out. 
So it's it, you, there's no definitive treatment. You have to be prepared to revise these procedures. Uh, in this case, for this patient, I, I do think now you have to address this hypotenuse maculopathy, and that's much more difficult in a trabeculectomy case. So I probably would have leaned towards a tube shunt based on the patient's age and the severity of the disease course and being able to go in and actually shut off the tube if you needed to easily. Uh, with shutting down a trabeculectomy, you it's very difficult to titrate that to know exactly how much fluid to let out. Uh, and so going into revise, it may completely shut the trap down and now you're gonna have to put a tube in. So I think most of us in our group here would probably lean towards a glaucoma drainage device for this particular patient based on age and the, the long time course and complexity. I do wanna have Tyler's presentation up. So if we're running on time, I think. Oh, there it is. I think, yeah, we should, because Tyler has a very interesting uh, presentation here as well. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dr. Mohammed, for that excellent presentation. Um, next up, we have Dr. Etheridge, one of our chief residents, also a top four chief resident. Um, he's going to pre be presenting on cognitive enhancing supplements in resident physicians. Mubarak, I'll leave your presentation up just in case there are any questions. All right. Thank you for the introduction. I thought that I didn't have any conflicts of interest, but apparently I have many. Um, <laughs> So uh, cognitive enhancement uh, is technically defined as taking supplements or medications uh, to improve memory, uh, boost levels of energy and wakefulness, as well as increase mental alertness or concentration. Um, the mechanism of action of these supplements and medications is inconclusive. Some work to increase circulating adrenaline. Uh, to help with wakefulness, while others modulate neurotransmitters such as dopamine. Uh, our initial study conducted here at the University of Utah showed that over 78% of all residents uh, take caffeine, uh, more than 19% take amphetamines, and over 11% take modafinil uh, for cognitive enhancement. Even though nearly 50% of those users reported experiencing side effects, specifically with the medications. Uh, this study showed that male residents in surgical subspecialties who were not married and did not have children were more likely to take those medications and supplements. Um, those who took cognitive enhancers were more likely to feel uh, pressure to perform well, uh, feel like, or I should say, feel afraid to be left behind by their peers or think that they could not have reached their current level of training without them. Medications and supplements taken for cognitive enhancement by ophthalmology residents in the United States has never been explored, um, at least to my knowledge. Um, ophthalmology residents, I think, are a pretty unique study population with multiple stressors that influence the likelihood of taking them. Um, some of these include long work hours and call, which contribute to uh, chronic fatigue, the personal and debt incurred from medical education costs, decreasing confidence in the job market with uh, optometry scope of practice expansion, as well as decreasing reimbursements, and uh, an increasing effort to master this rapidly expanding knowledge base in a more litigious medical landscape. Therefore, we sought to evaluate the prevalence, motivations, and side effects of cognitive enhancing medications and supplements among United States ophthalmology residents. We distributed an anonymous cross-sectional voluntary survey on cognitive enhancing medications and supplements to all United States ophthalmology residents using the web-based platform Qualtrics between March uh, and June of 2023. Residency program coordinators were asked to distribute the survey to their residents via email on two separate occasions. The first was directly from the researchers themselves 
And the second was through uh, AUPO sponsored um, email slash survey. No incentive was provided and respondents were asked to complete the survey only once. Survey sections included demographic information such as related medical diagnoses like ADHD and narcolepsy. We included additional questions such as the, whether or not the resident matched into, into their top three residency program, the residency program's ge geographic uh, region, as well as their call structure, and the resident's most recent uh, OCAP score and their intended uh, subspecialty. Sections on cognitive enhancing medications and supplements included the type, duration, frequency, side effects, as well as uh, motivations. We focused particular attention on amphetamines, methylphenidates, modafinil, and the supplements Nuept and Racetams, as these are explicitly taken for cognitive enhancement. Here are our results. According to the SF match ophthalmology resident results over the preceding four years, the total number of possible residents surveyed was uh, 2003. Of those 267 or about 13% uh, responded to our survey. This table shows unweighted descriptive statistics summarizing participant demographics. So among respondents, 28% were female, 48% were male, 24% uh, did not specify a gender, 38% were married, 16% had children, and 56% matched into their one of their top three residency programs. All U.S. geographic regions were represented. 58% uh, of respondents selected home call as their residency program call structure. All OCAP score quartiles were also represented, but unfortunately, 24% of respondents did not select a geographic region, 24% did not select a residency program call structure, and 56% did not specify an OCAP score quartile. Most respondents indicated they intended to pursue comprehensive ophthalmology at 24%. The next most common was unknown at 16%, followed by vitreo retinal surgery at 13%. 4% of respondents were diagnosed with ADHD and about 2% with shift work sleep disorder. Um, this table shows the weighted prevalence uh, for supplements. We estimate, uh, based on our survey results, that about 79% of ophthalmology residents use caffeine in some way, shape, or form which is the most common among all the supplements. About 18% do not use cognitive enhancing supplements. And about 4% of residents um, use other supplements, the most common being nicotine, creatine, and ratum, keratom. Um, it's a really scary one if you ever read about it. Um, this table shows the weighted prevalence for medications. Uh, based on our data, we estimate about 15% of ophthalmology residents take amphetamines, 3% take methylphenidate, and 6.5% to 7% take modafinil. Um, when uh, We asked respondents when they started taking supplements and medications and how often they take them or took them. Um, this table shows the weighted prevalence of amphetamines. Um, so we estimate that about 31% of residents started taking them in college and 55% started in medical school. However, 57% uh, said that they no longer take them. Um, these bar graphs show the reasons for taking supplements on the left and for taking medications on the right. Uh, the answer yes is represented in teal. The most common reason for taking supplements and medications, not surprisingly, were to improve concentration, memory, or alertness, and to increase studying or working time. Reported side effects for supplements were low. I think only one, one person uh, reported. This table shows the weighted prevalence of medication side effects, with the most common being a change in appetite, sleeplessness, and anxiety or paranoia. We asked whether residents who took cognitive enhancing supplements or medications had ever been asked to share or distribute them to their colleagues. 
we estimate that about 3% of residents have been asked to share their supplements and about 23% have been asked to share their medications. Represented in this figure uh, is the logistic regression for taking supplements. Um, it seems like having an in-hospital call system or a night float system and being diagnosed with ADHD were associated with a higher likelihood of taking supplements and then being from the Northeast and considering comprehensive ophthalmology or possibly glaucoma as a subspecialty were associated with a lower probability, again, for supplements. Uh, represented in this figure is the logistic regression for taking medications. Uh, scoring in the 51st to 75th percentile on the most recent OCAP exam and being diagnosed with ADHD were associated with a higher likelihood of taking medications and then being married was associated with a lower probability. I wouldn't be a millennial if I didn't have a photo of myself. Um, but when I reached this point in creating this presentation, I really had to ask myself, why do I care about this project? And why did I care about the one that preceded it? And as many of you know, in medical school, like many of my peers, I felt immense pressure to perform well. And I succumbed to that pressure by on one occasion, taking Adderall to prepare for a shelf exam, which was given to me by a friend. In residency, that pressure persisted, and through my encouragement, I received a diagnosis of shift work sleep disorder and was given a prescription for modafinil from my physician, which I used periodically throughout residency to be at my best when I was sleep deprived, mainly after call. Given I'm no longer taking primary call, and the side effects that I experienced, I no longer take modafinil, uh, but I realized that I started these research projects to see if I was alone in feeling pressure to perform at or above the level of my peers and respond as I did. With that in mind, I wanna focus on a unique group of ophthalmology residents that are highlighted in these data I want to focus on residents who self-medicated with cognitive enhancers when they started and why they did it. So considering that 4% of respondents had received a diagnosis of ADHD, yet over 17% uh, had taken amphetamines or methylphenidates, both of which are prescribed to treat ADHD, we could conclude that about 13% of ophthalmology residents self-medicated with amphetamines or methylphenidates. Similarly, considering 2% of residents had received a shift work sleep disorder diagnosis, yet 6.5% take modafinil, which is prescribed to treat that disorder, we could conclude that about 5% of ophthalmology residents self-medicate with modafinil. A majority of these residents started taking um, these medications in either college or medical school, and they did so with the express purpose of improving their memory, alertness, or concentration, and to increase their studying or working time. In addition, uh, and I think a good thing, many no longer take them, possibly because of the side effects they experienced. As it turns out, I'm not alone. Our study had several obvious limitations. Our survey was relatively newly developed and could exhibit measurement errors. There's no validated instrument to capture these data. However, we did follow best practices in survey development. This was a self-reported survey with the possibility of misreporting. Although we distributed the survey multiple times through various means, we had an overall low response rate and poor response to numerous questions. Uh, given that little is known about the survey non-responders, we of course cannot rule out the presence of non-response bias. And finally, we included limited demographic information to protect the anonymity of respondents. Uh, I'll leave today with a quote by the American author, Nora Zeal Hurston. Uh, Research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. These are my references. There are many people to acknowledge, uh, least of whom are listed here, and I will take any questions. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, you know, on many fronts, you you've taught all of us a tremendous amount. It, it was really shocking early on to see how little was known. Mm -hmm. 
I, I know you think a lot about um, the root causes uh, that would lead someone to use, um, you know, use cognitive enhancers or, you know, in, in, on another level, perhaps uh, have periods of burnout, uh, you know, periods where they're not well in medical training. Uh, and now that you've matched, uh, you're, you're, you're nearly out the door. Uh, just wonder if you could give us some perspectives on how we train, uh, in medicine in general and recommendations you would have, uh, at the undergraduate, um, GME level, and then our, our graduate GME level, uh, for improving the environment, uh, for learners. Yeah, I think that's a, a great and and complex and multifaceted question. And I think it has to go go way back, like high school, um, college. I think a lot of the driver that I experienced in my training was the the increasing performance or the improved performance. I mean, you know, you think about like USMLE step one scores and 10, 20 years ago, like a 230 was a good score. And then now we're declining people, not now, but previously with 260s, you know, 270 scores that I didn't even know existed. Um, and you see applications now and, and the first response is, oh my gosh, they're so, uh, they're so achieved. They have so many achievements. They have 30 publications and they're only, you know, a third year medical student. And we think, that in a positive light, which, which it is, but it also has a negative connotation or, or a, it came with consequences. Um, and I think some of those consequences are, are, are isolation. Uh, you know, I always think of medical training as like the perfect learn helplessness model. Um, I mean, you're one of the most stressful periods in an adult's life is changing a job and we're having learners change jobs almost daily, if not every half day, with a new boss, new expectations, new location, new staff and personnel. Um, I think that's a big component, but that's largely driven by ACGME having the requirements and we're you know, trying to fill holes. Uh, and that means residents have to go all over the place and, and train all over the place. Um, the match system is in and of itself, the basis of learned helplessness, which is I use that term learned helpless, helplessness because that's like the framework for how we think about anxiety and depression is like if things are happening to you and you have no control over the response, then that's kind of a recipe, especially if you have a genetic predisposition. Um, and medical medical training kind of highlights, like perfects that. Um, I think the financial aspect is is certainly something that you can't bat an eye at. You know, if you're coming out of medical school and you have... $300,000 in student loan debt and you're going and you want to be, and all you can get into is a general pediatrician program or pediatrics residency where your expected income is 90,000. You know, um, that can be really anxiety provoking. Um, and you know, from a financial perspective, it makes no sense, uh, which is not why we did this, but I think a lot of us hope that at the end we would be financially stable enough, um, that we could provide for ourselves and our family. Um, I think those are, yeah, they're, I, it's, I'm easy. It's easy to identify the problems. It's hard to identify the solutions, right? Um, we all like to, to complain and, and, and probably not come up with great solutions. Yeah. Yeah. To get married and have kids. children were apparently protective, which is interesting, yeah. but I know when I had both my kids in residency, uh, it's because I gave up. Yeah. And then I just didn't care anymore about being a great resident and I was just trying to survive. So maybe not I mean, the path to go. It's a change in perspective <laughs> though. I mean, I think that's really what it highlights is like when you're at least for those, of, I mean, we all did medical school, but it, man, it is so selfish. You are just like locked in on yourself and your daily achievements. And I remember, you know, coming out of an exam and like going to the mall and just walking around and be like, all of these people have this life that, you know, my life is getting up, studying, eating breakfast, studying, lunch, study, dinner, study, go to bed, repeat. And it's like, wow, this is like a whole big world. And I was coming away from, you know, living abroad for three years and working for a year. Um, so I can't imagine going straight through and like, you don't know anything else. Um, 
So having kids, getting, having a relationship like those, I think it makes sense that they're protect, protective because it changes your perspective. Um, sorry, I wish I could have just like dropped a big knowledge bomb and blown everybody's mind. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Chat. Uh, why are so Dr. Nakatsuka asked why are prospective glaucoma docs why do they have a lower likelihood of taking supplements? Maybe it's perspective again. I don't know. Oh, everything's futile. And yeah. it's uh... It's like you're making it up. Why, I mean, we're all that? making it up, but it's maybe, maybe glaucoma providers acknowledge that. Uh, and that's probably a good thing. That was the only question. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I have one more <clears throat> quick question, comment. Uh, great job, Tyler. One thing that I thought about a lot with this study is that how it's higher in surgical subspecialties and the use of like caffeine or other medications or supplements you think would increase tremor. So it makes me wonder like if people are taking uppers, are they also taking downers? Yeah. Um, are they taking things to sleep and also just performance in general? So um, I'm not sure there's any data out there, but I think that's just like an interesting thought. Yeah. There's some data in the retina fields uh, measuring tremor and taking beta blockers and caffeine and basically caffeine can lead to a tremor, which is measurable, but those results are like negligible for attending levels. So it's kind of like the study that there's a, a recent study in the retina field where, and uh, uh, Erica Wirtz can, can talk about this probably better than I can, but basically like sleep de deprivation affects trainees more than it does people who have been in the field and practicing for a, a substantial period of time. And the results of like beta blockers was similar. It helped trainees with tremor, but it didn't have any effect on attendings. Um, caffeine was more likely to affect trainees uh, as far as tremor than attendings. Um,